Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, the entire show is dedicated to bringing you highlights from last weekend's West Coast Strategy Conference in San Luis Obispo that focused on shutting down Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant. This two-day gathering featured experts from around the country sharing information, developing strategies, and further growing our community of dedicated activists. I recorded sessions and did individual interviews with some of the attending activists, which will be woven into the narrative. What struck me was how this was not just about one nuclear facility on the California coast. It was a template for understanding the industry, the problems with the reactors and fuel storage, the culture of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the nuclear industry, and the battles we face, along with a good supply of information to support our ongoing efforts. If you're concerned about nukes, this is for all of us, so stay tuned. Today is Tuesday, January 27, 2015, and the week's nuclear news consists of a recap of last weekend's conference. After a Friday night meet and greet, on Saturday morning, Jane Swanson of Mothers for Peace got us started with a little bit of humor, an explanation as to why Mothers for Peace does not have any chapters, despite the requests, and some down-home perspective on some of the nuclear industry's most cherished reassurances to those who live near a nuclear reactor. I'm wondering if the folks at pg e knew that the word Diablo means devil when they named it. It's such a good thing for it. That's the only thing they did right. To qualify as legal interveners with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Mothers for Peace needed to show that its members live within 50 miles of Diablo Canyon and are at risk of harm should Diablo have a very bad day. That's why we are strictly a local organization. A lot of people ask for chapters in other places. We, we don't because we can't. We want to keep that status. One of the Mothers for Peace projects is an interactive timeline of everything that has taken place and all original documentation in connection with Diablo Canyon. Here's what only Mothers for Peace would do, only because we're all volunteers. We drove down and picked up 86 boxes of legal documents a couple of years ago. We went through and we read them all. We sorted out 16 boxes worth that needed to be scanned and turned into digitally readable documents. For about five months, there was a team of about a dozen mothers who didn't do anything but scan documents, make them readable, and send them to uh, another wonderful mother, uh, Lucas Hickson, who has the um, technical ability to create this interactive timeline. It's taking a while, but we're getting close. Because in the next few months, I hope it's two months, maybe it'll be more, but we'll have this interactive timeline available to the whole world. So interactive means you click on the topic that you're interested in, and zoop, you can read the original documents. It's amazing. Jane offered several perspectives that contradict the nuclear industry's assumptions about what an evacuation would look like and how it would proceed. We all know from Fukushima that the radiation release is not going to blow over your house in three hours and then you go about your business. That's not going to happen. Look at Fukushima. It goes on forever. It can go on forever. So that's not a great choice. And can you imagine the traffic jams? Parents are told, in case of a radiation release, don't worry, we'll take care of your children, we'll, we'll shelter them, we'll take them on a bus to pass a roll or Santa Maria, depending on which way you think the wind is going to blow, and they'll be fine, we'll, you can get them in a few days. Well, a sane parent will be unable to comply with that, so that will contribute to the traffic jams. Magical thinking, that is their strong suit. They think if they imagine this it's all going to be fine, that, that that works. That's closely related to rationalizing away inconvenient facts like 
In 1971, the Shell oil geologist told us about the hottest reef fault, told us where it was, told us it was major, told us it was active. Well, pg e happened to not notice that for a couple of years until it was called to their attention, my mother's repeat, and then they swept it under the rug, and then the NRC gave the license anyway, and they said, oh, we're going to grandfather in this plant because pg e spent so much money on it. We just, I mean, we, we, we don't want to, like, stop the nuclear industry. So that, that's how pg e got its license. Lying, you know, about that. They have a great public relations staff. They're very well trained. I wish I could get trained by them. I'm not good sometimes. I don't respond quickly to lies. Jane Swanson. To orient us to the dangers of Diablo Canyon, Mothers for Peace played a video excerpt of Daniel Hirsch, lecturer at UC Santa Barbara, in his testimony before Senator Barbara Boxer's Committee on Environment and Public Works that took place on December 3, 2014. The Japanese parliamentary investigation into the Fukushima tragedy concluded that it was caused by a too cozy relationship between the reactor operator and its regulator that allowed the nuclear plant to be built to withstand only an earthquake and tsunami far smaller than actually occurred. These problems plague the American nuclear regulatory system as well. My testimony will focus on an examination of one case study, Diablo Canyon, that suggests the Fukushima lessons have not been learned here. This is particularly important in light of the extraordinary new seismic discoveries near the site and the inadequate response to them by the NRC. Unless the underlying dysfunctional nature of nuclear regulation in this country rapidly undergoes sweeping reform, a Fukushima-type disaster or worse can occur here, perhaps on the California coast. Diablo was designed and permitted based on the claim that there were no active earthquake faults within 30 kilometers of the site. We now know, however, that there are at least four large active faults nearby, all capable of more ground motion than the plant was originally designed for. Each time there was a new belated seismic discovery at Diablo, however, the commission gave pg e a pass. Rules were relaxed, safety margins reduced, public hearings denied. The most recent discoveries of increased seismic risk have met the same fate. At the construction permit hearings in 1970, the intervener asked for a few hours to present evidence of nearby faults. PG&E and the commission staff objected, and the NRC refused to permit the matter to be heard. One board member strenuously... Say that one more time, that last in, point. In 1970, interveners wanted a few hours to be able to present evidence of undiscovered faults. Both PG&E and the commission staff objected. The licensing board refused to permit the testimony. Tom Pigford, a member of the committee of the board, dissented, saying, shouldn't we find out before we pour concrete if there are earthquake faults? Thank you. He lost, and they went ahead and poured the concrete, and almost immediately it was revealed that there was an offshore fault, the Hosgri fault, much larger than the plant was designed for. But instead of withdrawing the permit or requiring a full upgrade to deal with the new fault, NRC waived the normal requirements of the license and granted an exception for the Hosgri. Only minimal, minimal retrofits were required. But it didn't end then. Within days of granting the operating license, NRC, egg on his face, had to rescind it because it turned out the pg e had used the wrong blueprints for putting in the retrofits, mirror image blueprints placing the uh, retrofits in the wrong places. They had to do it all over again, leading to a cost moving from $320 million to over $5 billion. The cost over end largely passed on to the ratepayer. But we were sure, don't worry, we're sure there can't be any more faults out there. And then, a few years later, the second and the third nearby faults were discovered, the Los Osos and San Luis Bay faults. Again, we were told, don't worry, there can't be any more surprises. And then in 2008, the U.S. Geologic Survey found the fourth fault that wasn't supposed to exist, the shoreline fault, coming within 600 meters of the plant. PG&E and NRC said, don't worry, the three recently identified faults were well within the license limits. But then something absolutely remarkable happened. Dr. Michael Peck, the uh, senior resident inspector for NRC at Diablo, actually went and checked the license. And what he discovered was that all three of those faults, according to PG&E itself, 
had ground motions greater than the plant license allowed. He said that it should be shut down until the problem was fixed. So PG&E proposed instead of fixing the plant to amend the license to remove the provisions they were violating. But even that didn't work because they couldn't meet the criteria for a license amendment, so they withdrew it. And that should have been the end of the matter. The plant should have been shut down until it was retrofitted. But instead, NRC allowed PG&E to, in essence, amend the license without amending the license, all to avoid a public hearing. And then Peck took the gutsy step of filing the dissenting professional opinion, which this September, as expected, the NRC rejected. But here's where the story gets most troubling, with developments essentially not reported to the public until today. On the very same day NRC issued to the news media its denial of Dr. Peck's dissent, PG&E released an 1,800-page study required by the state um, of the uh, seismic situation near the facility. And they discovered that the shoreline fault, which they hadn't even known about until a few years earlier, was twice as long as they previously thought, that a number of the faults are now estimated to produce larger magnitude earthquakes than they had thought just a few years ago, and that, again, all of these are estimated to produce ground motions in excess that was permitted in the license for all faults except the Hanscree. It's deja vu all over again, repeat of the problem we've seen year after year after year. And unless we fix these problems, uh, regulated entities pressing for weakening of safety requirements and of regulators viewing themselves more as allies of the industry rather than protectors of public safety, we will not have learned the lessons of Fukushima. And a Fukushima-type disaster is just waiting to happen here. All it takes, just as at Fukushima, is an earthquake larger than the plant was designed to withstand. It could happen tomorrow. Daniel Hirsch. Linda Seeley of Mothers for Peace talked to us about radiation monitoring and the problems of getting accurate numbers from Diablo Canyon. It is supposed to be doing radiation testing uh, around the United States, and after um, Fukushima, uh, they took offline almost all of their uh, radiation monitoring, and we haven't had it back up since. The closest radiation uh, RADNET station is in Bakersfield, which is about 120 miles from here. During the last outage at Diablo Canyon, when they were doing the transfer of fuel, um, there, there were the huge elevations of gamma radiation were showing up on this, um, me these meters at, out in um, Bakersfield, over 10,000 counts per minute, and it was congruent with that fuel fueling outage during uh, November and December of this past year. Right, and then the other day it was really strangely high too, up over 10,000 again, and I don't know why. Diablo Canyon does have radiation monitoring. They have to. They monitor 24-7, but we can't, nobody can access that except them. You don't get the information for over a year after they've collected it. You, the latest report you can find is from 2013. There are literally hundreds of radionuclides that are allowed to be released at Diablo Canyon, and it's extremely obscure unless you happen to be like a radiation biologist or something like that. It's very hard to understand the data. We have three people around here who are currently collecting uh, radiation samples uh, from the air. All three of them, interestingly, do not want to appear in public, and they don't especially want their identities to be known outside to the public. the guy in Paso Robles, which is, if you're not from here, Paso Robles is north and east of Diablo Canyon. So he's continuously getting elevated um, readings on his um, Geiger counter. If you don't live near a nuclear power plant, the normal uh, background radiation is usually between 15 and 20 counts per minute. He's always getting um, at least like 45, 50. At one time, he got a spike up into the 600s this past April, um, as did uh, the other guy who lives 
south of the plant in Shell Beach, just a few miles from the plant. We are getting these spikes. We don't, there, and PG, when we call PG&E and say, hey, what's going on out there? We've got a spike in radiation. They say, uh, nothing. It, we didn't get that. Uh, so it's, it's not, they're, they're not making the, uh, information available to us. That's why we have the cancer clusters. That was Linda Seeley. Jerry Brown, no, not the governor, the Jerry Brown of World Business Academy, introduced information from the Joseph Mangano Radiation and Public Health Project study of cancer rates around Diablo Canyon that Linda referenced. We looked at several things. We looked at strontium-90 levels in baby teeth in California, and then we also looked at cancer rates uh, before Diablo opened and then in the decades after Diablo opened. We also, and that was done by county data. This is all public data. And then we also looked by zip code. And this is really significant because California is the only or one of the only states that presents uh, health data by zip code. And we also looked at low birth weight, extreme low birth weight, infant mortality uh, in this study. A little background on the strontium-90 study. The Radiation and Public Health Project, which is radiation.org, radiation.org, uh, they conducted a major study of using public data, every woman who died of breast cancer between 1955 and 1985 in every county, the 3,000 plus counties in the United States. And they found that if a woman lived within 100 miles of a nuclear plant, she was at a higher significant rate risk of dying of breast cancer than for the women who lived in counties that were over 100 miles away. Um, this was done with maps. It's, if you go to radiation.org and you can find the study, it was called The Enemy Within the Risk of Living Near a Nuclear Plant. But in a way, this is like a correlation, all right? I drank milk, I got cancer, the milk caused cancer. So it's one piece in the epidemiological analysis. Uh, in order to go to the next level, Jay Gould, deceased, and Ernest Sternglass in his later years, a very brilliant radiation physicist, uh, very anti-nuclear, uh, said, we need to do a second baby T study in American history. The first baby T study was done under the threat of the bomb testing. The Geiger counters were going off. And what it was actually funded, believe it or not, by the U.S. Public Health Service, done by the University of Washington in St. Louis. Barry Commoner was involved there. They got 300,000 baby teeth, and man-made strontium-90, which was non-detectable before bomb testing, went up, 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 and that's evidence which used <coughs> for Kennedy to convince the reluctant Senate to ban above-ground and underwater bomb testing in 1963. Khrushchev was hearing the same thing. We're killing our own people through these bomb tests. He was hearing the same thing from Sakharov, the father of the Soviet H-bomb. So that's why, at the height of the Cold War, so this was part of the data we looked at in this study. He looked at the background of the radioactive waste at Diablo Canyon and also looked at the Union of Concerned Scientists study, Seismic Risk, which I recommend to all of you, um, where uh, they concluded that Diablo Canyon was at a one in six chance of an earthquake that the reactor could not handle in every year of operation. If that's not playing radioactive roulette, with the lives of people. I don't know what it is. But the interesting thing from the California strontium-90 levels, the body looks at different isotopes in different ways. Radioactive iodine into the thyroid, or, um, plutonium into the genitals, uh, cesium into the soft tissue. Strontium, the body thinks is calcium, so it takes it into the bones and teeth. So you can actually assay strontium by collecting the baby teeth that fall out, sending them to an independent lab, running them through a scintillation counter, and getting results in Pico Curie's per gram calcium or Millie Becquerel's per gram calcium. Was that strontium-90 levels were increasing steadily in California in the late 1990s versus the late 1980s. Now, after bomb testing ends, as you'll see, strontium-90 should be going down. The important thing here is stront if strontium-90 is present, it's a marker that many of the other 100 isotopes produced by a fission reaction are uh, also present in the body. Kennedy, I don't know where we're going to find presidents who will do something, take courageous action like this, said, look, 
Even the loss of one child from radiation from bomb tests is of concern to us all. What have the laws of physics and biology changed uh, since Kennedy made this statement? Because I know this is a very well-informed audience, but most of the public has no idea that the NRC uh, and the EPA allows the normally operating reactors to emit radioactive gases and effluents on a routine basis. They say they're safe. We know they're not. This is what happens to strontium-90. We collected 5,000 teeth, 3,000 of them got tested and all written up, and you can find this at radiation.org in seven peer-reviewed journal articles. Okay, so here comes strontium-90 during the bomb test years. Uh, you all know we exploded bombs in the atmosphere. We exploded the equivalent of 14,000 Hiroshima weapons in the atmosphere. The Soviet Union did more. So now what happens is 1963, peak of bomb testing, strontium-90 measured per year of the birth tooth starts to decline. Test ban, and now in the 70s, nuclear power expands dramatically. Next slide. Now, strontium-90, which should have gone down again to low, 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 almost non-detectable, and this is on our website as well, a surprising upturn in strontium-90. They said, oh, you know, bomb testing, it's all taken care of. We said, where's the experimental evidence? And I won't get into the history of the U.S. government's retreat from measuring these isotopes in the, in the atmosphere. You can find that all in the enemy within. And here we go, estimated up to 2013. And if you'll notice, the radiation levels in baby teeth are up to the level of the peak of the bomb test years. And one newspaper reporter who looked at this kind of with objective eyes said, oh my God, we have undermined all of the health effects of the historic 1963 bomb test treaty. Basically, what the study found was that in comparing before Diablo Canyon opened, within the decades, two decades after Diablo Canyon opened, that San Luis Obispo County went from a low cancer county to a high cancer county. Jerry Brown of World Business Academy. Linda Seeley of Mothers for Peace returned to help us understand the significance of the Mangano Report. What we did was ask the health agency to offer free, free cancer testing for the four types of cancer that are, that, are, that are significantly elevated here. Those are breast cancer, thyroid cancer, melanoma, which is over the top here. It's the highest incidence of melanoma in the whole state of California, here in San Luis Obispo County. And then the fourth is childhood leukemia. So we ask that the health department offer free, free screening for these different kinds of cancer. And we didn't say it's because of Diablo Canyon. It was, wasn't, we didn't link it with that. We just said, look, there's a high incidence of cancer here. You have a public health obligation to uh, do something about it, to make sure that people are getting early detection and early treatment for, for these problems that we have here that are apparent in, that have been made apparent through this study. And what the health agency said was that that was not a responsibility of the public health department. And they said the Mangano study was junk science. And they have strongly stood by that very, very uh, defensive about it. Shoot the messenger. Don't, don't address the problem. That's, that's their response. A couple of us from the Sierra Club uh, board asked to meet with them, and they refused to meet with us because they thought that it was irrelevant and, and that we were uh, coming in as a hostile group. What happened what, out of that was this. There's another nonprofit group here in town that decided they were going to take on this problem. We have a free clinic here in town. It's, it's called the Noor Clinic, N-O-O-R. Clinic, N -O -O -R. <clears throat> it's absolutely free for anybody to go to, whether you have insurance or not. So what they did was they went to the Noor Clinic, and they said, look, look at this study. Look at what we've got going here. And um, the Noor Clinic found an epidemiologist at Cal Poly, and this, this epidemiologist is very interested in this uh, cancer cluster that we have here. And so the, they had a fundraiser to fund the testing at the free clinic. 
And now the free clinic is offering uh, testing to anybody who has the three types of cancer, breast, uh, melanoma, and uh, thyroid, but they haven't yet gotten it together because it's more expensive to screen for childhood leukemia, so they're not offering that yet. Um, and then uh, the nonprofit is uh, proposing to go out to the high incidence areas of the county where there, there appear to be clusters and going door to door, knock on doors, and say, this is a high cancer cluster area or a high cl cancer incidence area, you can get free testing for this. And then they'll um, share that information with the free clinic and it hopefully will be able to collect better data then the health department is um, willing to cooperate with. Linda Seeley of Mothers for Peace. Damon Moglin is Senior Nuclear Advisor to Friends of the Earth, and he proved a powerhouse of information and insight. I first spoke with Damon privately before his presentation. I'm Damon Moglin, and I'm with Friends of the Earth, and um, we're running a campaign to shut Diablo Canyon and replace it with renewable energy. Um, Diablo Canyon, I believe, is the most dangerous nuclear power plant in the United States of America. It's built in an area that has a tremendous array of seismic faults. Uh, we could have an absolutely catastrophic nuclear disaster at Diablo if there were to be a major earthquake that would overwhelm the safety systems at the plant. And um, the bottom line is nobody would ever get the licenses to build a nuclear plant at Diablo Canyon now. Why is it that we would want to ra operate a 1960s-era nuclear reactor there? Um, it simply doesn't make sense. We don't need the power from Diablo, which is surplus to need here in the state of California. Um, this is a dirty and dangerous plant that can simply be replaced with clean, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and energy storage. And I think that ultimately the fight over Diablo is really a fight about whether or not California is prepared to enter the 21st century and be using clean, renewable energy and not dirty and dangerous uh, nuclear energy of the 20th century. Damon then gave the first of several presentations, this one on the role the Public Utilities Commission must be forced to play in the shutdown of Diablo Canyon. And like it or not, for right or for wrong, for good or for bad, the PUC, as folks living in California, is a critical place for us to use the power of the purse to close down nuclear plants. So I just would say that um, I think personally that a campaign that does not seek to use the PUC to close nuclear plants is a campaign that will not succeed. We all need to really be thinking also about how do we force the PUC uh, to take Diablo on and how to make them accountable. <clears throat> and I not only think that that's about um, whether or not it's prudent to continue to pump any more ratepayer money into what is a decrepit, outdated, and dangerous nuclear facility it's also about this very thing that a number of us have been talking about, which is this about turning away from nuclear technology in California and turning towards solar, wind, renewable technology, and energy storage. Because like it again, or not, whereas the California Energy Commission can make recommendations about energy policy, it's the PUC that's going to make decisions about where the money goes and which technologies win and which technologies lose. And the fact of the matter is that in accordance with state policy, it's PUC policy to use money in the future for the installation of what are called preferred resources, wind, solar, energy storage, and efficiency. The rule is that those new technologies are supposed to get the new money as a priority. So again, I think that what we all have to be thinking about as we campaign is that we need to be saying, we don't want any more money going to Diablo. We don't want any more money wasted on Diablo. And in fact, we want a prudency process in which you investigate the prudency of spending a dime more on Diablo. And as part of that, we need a plan B, a plan to instead replace all of its energy with renewable energy. There's really only one acceptable policy option, and that is that PG&E has to be forced to comply with the rules of the state that all of the other utilities have been forced to comply with, and that they should be forced to build cooling towers. So the law has to be applied to everybody, given that Diablo Canyon amounts to 80% of the damage from all of the coastal power plants combined. There is no policy if you do not apply it to Diablo. So 
in this next month, month and a half, those uh, those options are going to come out. I know Mothers and We are going to work on it. I know Sierra. I think a lot of the organizations, um, the Business Council, of course, is working on it and has been a real leader as well. Um, so I'd like to just say that please keep your eye out for when that comes. It's extremely important. Uh, I know the Schumacher are going to also be working on this issue because it, it, it also is incredible that we're going to have a marine sanctuary and yet we've got this deadly predator that's allowed to continue operating right here. It, it makes a mockery of the whole idea of protecting the environment. Damon Moglin. Donna Gilmore of San Onofre Safety next filled us in on the false promise of safe storage of radioactive waste in dry casks. We have some serious issues with the dry cask storage situation in the United States and at San Onofre and at Diablo Canyon. The canisters that the United States is using and Diablo is using and San Onofre is using are thin canisters that are subject to cracking in our ocean environment. These canisters were just designed to last a short time, but now we have a game-changer event. The NRC has decided they can stay right where they are indefinitely. So we need a better solution. These canisters may crack from the ocean environment. They call it stress corrosion cracking, and this may start happening within 30 years of when they're loaded. They cannot be inspected, even on the outside, for corrosion or cracks. They can't be repaired. There's no early warning system in place to warn us that they're going to crack, so we won't know until after they crack and release radiation into the environment. The EPRI, which is an, an industry research company, they looked at the surface, a little bit of the surface at, at a Diablo Canyon uh, canister. It's a Holtec brand, the same one that they want to use uh, at San Onofre. They looked at the surface. They can't get to the whole canister. They could only see a little piece of it, and they scraped off some surface material. They found corrosive salt, magnesium chloride salt, on the canister after only two years of it being loaded with fuel. This is the material that can cause corrosion and cracking in that canister. The NRC thought it was going to take 30 years before the temperature would be low enough on these canisters for the salt to dissolve and start the corrosion cracking process. They were wrong. They found the salt, they found the temperature low enough for the humidity, the moisture in the air, to be able to stay on the canister long enough to dissolve the salts. But, but the problem is the NRC is not dealing with this. And to make matters worse, even though Edison knows about this and PG&E knows about this, they want to continue to buy these inferior canisters. Edison is planning to spend about $1.3 billion, not million, billion dollars to buy these inferior uh, Holtec thin canister sy uh, system. There are also many other corrosion factors that have not been addressed in these uh, thin canisters. The NRC just hasn't gotten around to, to, to researching those. Regarding repairing thin canisters, Dr. Singh, who is the president and CEO of Holtec, even the president of the company that makes these canisters, says you shouldn't even attempt to repair these canisters. That just creates a rough surface that can be the trigger for a new, new corrosion down the road. And he also said microscopic cracks can release millions of curries of radiation into the environment. In addition, there is no plan for replacing crack canisters. No funds have been budgeted for that, and the NRC allows the spent fuel pools where the, um, the, the fuel is 
put into right after it comes out of the reactor. It stays in there for a number of years cooling before it can put into canisters. Once the canisters are emptied, like at San Onofre, you know, when they're decommissioning, they, they eventually will take the fuel out of the pools and put it into these canisters. And once the pools are empty, the NRC is allowing them to destroy the pools. The pools are the only way that if there was a crack canister that they could put the fuel back underwater in the pools so they could transfer it to another one. The NRC allows them to remove them. In fact, at Humboldt Bay up in Northern California and at Rancho Seco near Sacramento, they've already removed the pools. So those canisters are like ticking time bombs, and no one's going to know when they're going to crack open, and they got no plan in place. And, in fact, at Humboldt Bay, the NRC just approved the elimination of all emergency planning. They don't even have to notify the local and state government about any kind of, uh, you know, radiation leak or anything. They don't even have to notify them anymore. They, they just have this illusion that nothing's going to go wrong. The canisters that they're planning to use at uh, San Onofre, they are currently not approved by the NRC, yet the Edison announced they're already buying it. Uh, and the PUC, has the California Public Utilities Commission, has not approved the money for this system. And we're urging, and we want to continue to urge people to tell your elected officials, local, state, and the, and the PUC not to approve the money for these uh, inferior canisters that may crack right here within the next 30 years. There are better systems on the market. And these canisters are not designed to be replaced. They're, they have a welded shut lid, so they were designed for short-term storage. In addition, no sped fuel in one of these canisters has ever been reloaded into another thin canister. They've never, it has to be done underwater, and they've never even tried it. So this is really an unproven system, immature industry that's only been around a few years. In addition, there is no defense in depth in these thin canisters. What that means is if that stainless steel canister, it's only half inch to five eighths inch thick, if that cracks open, there's nothing else in place to stop that radiation from getting out. Those canisters, because they're so thin, they don't protect from certain kinds of radiation, such as gamma and neutron. Because of that, they take the thin canisters and they put them in these big concrete overpacks. The uh, industry always says, oh, these are really it's thick concrete overpacks. But what they don't tell you is there's vents in that concrete that keeps the inner thin stainless steel canister cool with convection cooling. So actually this convection cooling process makes a nice distribution system for moving the, the radiation out if there is a crack in that canister. Um, in, a, in addition, because of the limitations of the thin canister for protection, they require the purchase of a another cast just to transport it from the pool into the cement thing. And in addition to that, they require um, a transportation cask uh, to have them stored in a transportation cask if you want to move them off site. And that transportation cask hasn't even been approved by the NRC. And in addition, Holtec hasn't even submitted an application to get approval from the NRC for that uh, transportation cask. Now, one of the problems we have at San Onofre and at Diablo Canyon is about 10 years ago, they started using what's called high burn-up fuel. Uh, this fuel burns longer in the reactor, which makes the utilities more money. However, it results in nuclear waste that's over twice as radioactive and over twice as hot as what they used to use, the lower burn-up fuel. In addition, uh, there's a protective zirconium fuel cladding on the uranium, and this high, this high burn-up, damages that fuel cladding and makes it brittle even after dry storage. Um, and the result of that is you have unstable and unpredictable fuel in storage and transport. I mean, the NRC will admit that they don't know what's going to happen after this uh, fuel is in storage and what's going to happen in transport. It, well, it's impossible to examine these this what they call fuel assemblies um, for damage before they even put it in the dry cast they 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 can't see all the parts of it so we don't know if any of the fuel they're putting in, in these casts um, is are, already has damage cladding on it and the best technology in the world are thick casts these thick casts are up to 20 inches thick 
compared to the thin canisters, which are uh, one-half inch to five-eighths inches of a thick. The thick canisters won't crack. They can re be repaired. They can be inspected. They have an early warning monitor system prior to releasing radiation. They meet international certifications. They've been in use for over 40 years, unlike ours, which are about 20 years max. Um, they have defense in depth, so that you don't have a single point of failure. You have redundancy. In addition, in uh, Germany and at Fukushima, they store their thick casts in a concrete reinforced buildings for extra protection from the environment and under other external hazards. And you don't need any kind of concrete overpack because they're so thick they protect from the gamma and neutron radiation so employees can actually get close to them without, you know, the concern with the, with the radiation. The thick casts um, are the market leader in the rest of the world. So we are out of step with what the rest of the world is doing. They are more concerned about safety. They knew there was no guarantee there would be a permanent repository. So they erred on the side of safety, and we didn't. Donna Gilmore of SanOnofreSafety.org. Attorney Mike Aguirre spoke about whistleblower safety issues. The whistleblower gives you the story that really is taking place behind the scenes. The whistleblower is your access to the truth. Somewhere out there, there are people that know what's going on at Diablo Canyon that would give you your best chance. You may not even know about it. Maybe you do know about it. But those individuals, if they come forward, and we represent whistleblowers uh, at, at uh, Southern Cal Edison. I've represented whistleblowers. It's a very lonely thing to do because if they come forward, and they're found out, they'll be retaliated against, obviously, uh, and it ruins their lives. And so it's always a trade-off between the greater good uh, and uh, the individual impact on their lives. That having been said, one of the techniques that the uh, folks that investigate organized crime tries, try to use, and I've tried to use it myself, is that if you create enough of an environment where the whistleblower thinks that there is a safe haven, that there's enough of an uproar, like this group right here, for them to feel comfortable to come forward, you have media coverage, you have media protection, you have investigative reporters, and you have a rapid flow of information so no one person can be singled out. It's a very, very powerful tool. The, the role of the whistleblower uh, is a critical role because it will give you the inside information that you don't already have, and it will allow you to operate on the same plane as the decision makers are operating. That was attorney Mike Aguirre. Here's the dynamic veteran activist Harvey Wasserman sharing directly what the weekend was all about. I'm Harvey Wasserman. I, I live in Ohio and in California. Um, and it's time to definitively end the failed nuclear experiment. All these 99 reactors in the U.S. and about uh, a little under 400 now worldwide need to shut down as soon as possible, before the next earthquake, hopefully, so that we don't have any more Fukushimas, we don't have any more Chernobyls or Three Mile Islands. What we do have is a transition to Solartopia, the green-powered Earth, which uh, is totally feasible, and the only way we're really going to have any economic, ecological, or environmental future. And so, uh, and it's all doable. We're here to shut the Apple Canyon. We're going to hopefully be shutting reactors in Ohio and elsewhere around the United States and the world and make this transition so our children and grandchildren, as well as us for the rest of our lives, are going to have a decent planet to live on. Harvey Wasserman. So what are some strategies to close down Diablo Canyon and the other 97 nuclear reactors in the U.S.? We don't want to give away any of our juicier plums, but we had some terrific speakers cover basic points in how to structure our strategies, and these extrapolate out to your nuclear situation as well. Nuclear engineer, whistleblower, 
and now educator and consultant Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education joined us by phone to discuss two specific strategic points. We've got 440 nukes for 40 years, and there's been five meltdowns. So that means one out of every 100 nukes has melted down. Now, that's a pretty crappy uh, uh, crappy odd. I wouldn't walk across the street if I knew there was a one in a hundred chance I was going to get run over. And one of these communities out of every hundred has had it happen, despite the fact that nice people, safety conscious people, ran these plants. So let's look at the five nuclear plants that have shut down and the one that should have shut down but didn't in the last year. And, uh, you know, the five are... Um, San Onofre 2 and 3, Crystal River 3, Vermont Yankee, and uh, Kiwani. And the one that should have shut down was Fort Calhoun. Of those five that did shut down, four have a common theme, and that's um, management screw-ups. If you look at uh, San Onofre, near and dear to me, and Maggie and the people of Friends of the Earth, as well as a, a wonderful team of activists in, uh, down there. You know, we caught them uh, trying to break the law. We caught them with this 5059 issue where they tried to avoid getting a new design licensed. And uh, that was something that the public understood. So uh, number one is, uh, is San Onofre 2 and 3. Crystal River is the same. That's in Florida. Uh, just north of uh, Clearwater. It was uh, during a steam generator modification, management cut a hole in the side of the nuclear containment. Now, they could have hired an expert to do it, but they were all on bonus plans, and they decided to save $15 million and do it themselves. They kind of like, oh, they had slept at a Holiday Inn Express, so they became experts. The, the, the net effect is they cracked it. So a management screw-up, Cause the containment to crack, to delaminate like a Firestone 500 tire. They, they tried to repair it, it cracked again, and they hung on for four years trying to repair it, and it was a total failure. But what alienated the people was the integrity issue. So, you know, here's another integrity issue here where managers on bonus plans tried to do it quick and dirty and put safety second. And then the, the net effect was that the plant could not be repaired and was forced to shut down. And in Florida, it resonated, even in Florida, it resonated that the people that ran the plant were less than competent. So that's number three. Number four is from my Yankee. And uh, Maggie and I and New England Coalition and the uh, you know, Deb Caps, Caps, Katz group, uh, uh, CAN, and, and hundreds of other activists worked on that for some for as long as 40 years. But I got involved in 2003, and they knowingly and deliberately withheld information from me as a witness, and they were fined $51,000. The next year, they knowingly and deliberately tried to hide a building that they were trying to sneak onto the site, and they were fined $82,000. Then they had a fire and a transformer caused by faulty maintenance practices, and uh, they were down for half a month. Then they had the infamous cooling tower collapse, and they were uh, down for months after that. And then finally, they lied to the state about the underground um, pipes that were leaking. And um, even though Entergy will say they shut down for my Yankee because of economics, that's really not true. They had seven nuclear reactors in that same category. And they chose Vermont Yankee in part because, uh, in large part, because of a dedicated group of activists who held the focus not on some technical um, issue, but on the issue of integrity. These were people that couldn't be trusted. So four of the five nukes that shut down last year had integrity issues. The, the fifth is Kiwani and um, it, that's just out of the blue. It um, shut down on economics. So the one that should have shut down and didn't is Fort Calhoun. And Fort Calhoun is uh, jokingly called Port Calhoun because it was the one that was completely engulfed in the Missouri River. And there, 
the, the utility managed to hold the issue to very technical issues, and the very small activist base couldn't get a foothold to bring up the broader uh, integrity issues, which were which were there, but could not be uh, never really made uh, headway. You know, I think the uh, the difference there is that they had a very pro nuclear board at OPPD and that's the Omaha Public Power District. And economics be damned, they were going to get this plant running again. So now let's let's take these lessons and, and apply them to Diablo. I think you've got one or two integrity issues that have legs that the people understand. I'm going to back up one second here. Uh, Maggie and I, um, during the 2003, 4, 5, 6 time span, um, we were talking about safety problems and uh, something called net positive suction head problems, on and on and on. And people's eyes would glass, glaze over and um, that they just don't understand uh, one in a hundred chance of having their town blown to smithereens. But when we brought up the decommissioning cost, and all at once, people in Vermont realized, oh, my God, where every single person in the state is going to be on the hook for a 1000 bucks. That got traction. That was the first issue in 2007 that got traction with people. So the, the, the issues that get traction are money and, uh, and, and integrity. Okay, so let's go back to Diablo now. In my mind, the two issues are this uh, the tsunami risk being um, ignored, well, not ignored, but being hidden for 10 years. And, uh, you know, thanks to uh, mothers and, and other activists for getting that out there. And the second one, and bigger, is the, is the seismic issue. And I'm sure you've been over it um, in, in some detail uh, yesterday and, and perhaps later today. But the, the deal with the seismic thing is this. Anybody who's had a British car, uh, they don't call shock absorbers shock absorbers in England. They call them ampers. It's the same thing as a shock absorber. What happened at uh, Diablo was that the plant was built, and it was built to move a lot in an earthquake. And the earthquake they assumed was a 0.4 G seismic quake. So then when they found Hosgree and all the others, they realized, oh, my God, the ground acceleration is twice what we thought it is. Now, the building had already been built, so they couldn't really rebuild this darn thing to uh, accommodate a bigger earthquake. So they changed the numbers. And the number they changed is called the damping coefficient. So think about dampers on a sports car, the, the shock absorbers. They changed the assumed response of the shock absorbers, and they made the plant analytically stiffer. So they uh, changed the numbers to make the earthquake go away. And to my way of thinking, that's an integrity issue. I testified with Friends of the Earth and uh, Dick Ayers, who's their attorney, um, in January of uh, two years ago <laughs> at um, at, at San Onofre. And literally, the chairman of the petition review board that we were speaking to fell asleep twice during my presentation. Oh. So that's an indication of how uh, excited the NRC is to get involved in a, uh, an issue like this. But you've got one here. And um, I think if we just argue about whether the earthquake is 0.4 or 0.7, uh, people's eyes are going to glaze over again. But I think if you hold it to breaking the law and integrity issues, you stand a chance of getting, uh, of continuing the momentum that you've already developed out there. Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds.org. Then Damon Moglin talked us through the key pressure points he sees for shutting down Diablo Canyon. I'm going to spend the short time I have talking a little bit about messaging, not, not because I think I've got the greatest ideas about that or Friends of the Earth has the greatest ideas, but um, I think that in the course of talking about this and talking with you, I think that a number of the key messages in our campaign have kind of come together. I think that 
Um, um, Tim gave a great presentation this morning about kind of nukes and climate change, which I, I thought was fabulous, and I encourage you to look at. I mean, I think the point is that um, Diablo Canyon is generating, as we all know, um, uh, dirty, dangerous, and um, uneconomic power. I think that that is a very simple and basic message that we've got to stick with. I also think that the seismic stuff is really, really, really genuinely pants on fire scary. And I think that um, anybody who lives on, in California uh, has that kind of uneasy relationship to earthquakes. Um, you know, we, we, we take it for granted that we live in a place where they exist, and at the same time we kind of rationalize the risk. But I think that, again, folks understand that um, if we don't really need this plant and we don't really need the energy from it and we don't need to spend all that extra money, how in the world do you think it's you know sane to have a plant in a place where you could never build a nuclear power plant now? I think that's also a really important message for people that um, state regulators, federal regulators would never license a nuclear power plant at Diablo Canyon. Why are we operating a 1960 vintage plant in such a place? It's insane. It doesn't make sense. And then I think there is an opportunity with some people to talk about, look, this is a classic example of um, corporate profits over public safety. And we've seen from the example of what happened at Fukushima, we've seen from the example of what's happened elsewhere, be it the BP spill, whatever, where you get when you allow corporate profit to overwhelm public safety. Um, so I think that these are really very basic messages, very clear messages, and I think they're ones that generally work. I feel that our campaign right now does struggle with getting our issue into the media. Um, I don't know about how well you feel, but I've been struck by the difficulty of getting journalists to pay attention to what's going on at Diablo, and I would love to hear people's ideas about that, but I do want to encourage all of you um, that the media does, especially in this kind of social media world, they do actually pay attention to how many comments they get on articles, on stories. They do pay attention to these online polls they conduct. Um, and we need to use our own social networks to make sure that when we have an opportunity to comment on a good story, comment on a bad story, um, or comment on these polls, jump on them, you know, take advantage of that. Um, and I think it is very important that Letters to the Editor remains a, a thing uh, that has an impact, that makes the press and editorial boards, and as much as newspapers have editorial boards and they don't very much anymore, but it makes the, the heads of these media entities pay attention if they're getting a lot of uh, letters and those kind of things. So I, I, I do think it's critically important that we continue to press the media to cover these stories. We need to demand that these are uh, real stories of public attention and that the media needs to be covering them. Friends of the Earth's Damon Moglen. This was by no means a full presentation of the conference because that would take, well, an entire weekend. Many of the presenters I was unable to share with you here will be the subject of future Nuclear Hot Seat interviews, and others will have their entire presentations shared in the coming weeks. For now, may this appetizer plate of information have proved instructive, inspirational, or helped light a fire in your belly to keep going, or to join us for the first time, or maybe even come over from the dark side. Links to the speakers heard in this show and their organizations will be found on the website nuclearhotseat.com under this episode, number 188. A reminder that I'm still raising funds to attend Dr. Helen Caldicott's Symposium on the Dynamics of Possible Nuclear Extinction, held in New York at the end of February. If you wish to donate and help me provide coverage of that symposium, as I've just provided coverage of this conference, you can donate by going to nuclearhotseat.com, scrolling down on the homepage, and clicking on the big red Donate button. Thanks so much for any help you can provide. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, January 27, 2015. Thanks to EM3 for audio of Dan Hirsch from the Barbara Boxer Senate hearings, to Donna Gilmore of San Onofre Safety for her help with travel arrangements, and to Myla Reason for thinking up and executing the banner featured in the photo on our website. Now don't go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear Hot seat.
We offer blessings to the great creator. We offer blessings to Mother Earth. And it goes on forever.